been at uni all day. Yeah, she comes home, tired, I'm thinking, perfect, excuse to postpone yet again. <laughs> <laughs> no such luck. Oh, KPIs, the KPI one. Yes. I'm actually excited for this one. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. <laughs> I actually have something to contribute. Yeah. yeah. Hello, dear listeners. Uh, welcome to another episode of Statistically Insignificant. My name is Tess, my pronouns are she, they, and I'm here in the Podcast to Performance Management Seminar. Our output has been too low, I've had too little cat content and too many dick jokes. So I'm here being lectured by some dipshit with a business degree, and I'm not happy about it. Trying to set fire to a motivational poster. It's Bart. How's it going, Bart? Hey, how's it going? I go by he and him, and um, is there supposed to be free drinks after this? That's the only reason I came, and it doesn't seem like much fun as of yet. <laughs> Look, I'm going to be honest. I thought of smuggling gin in, but decided against it because that <laughs> smell would f- travel. In the back row, half asleep and thinking about Pathfinder, it's Dean. What? Yes, yes, yeah, my KPI is still great, thank you. Uh, hi, I also go by he, him. My KPIs are great. Oh, good. My boss is very happy with everything I've been doing. That's good. Everything they think I've been doing. <laughs> <laughs> so speaking of cat content, we have had the arrival of the feline. Hello, buddy, welcome to the desk. <laughs> you, you got a podcast? Me? Nope. I will grab you. Ah! He was standing like two feet away from the desk and did a spectacular leap over my deodorant bottle that's sitting on the edge there, right into the middle of my notes. You did real parabola there. Well done, buddy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. KPIs for cat? Positive. Good. Good. He's going to fight you until he gets to the desk, dude. Go ahead, Kato. Cat PIs. Yeah, cat PIs. Cat with a K PI. Cat private investigator? (laughs) <laughs> That's a way cooler idea than KPIs. <laughs> what the fuck's a KPI? So, KPIs, Key Performance Indicator, also called Performance Indicator, Performance Metric. Same idea is kind of all over these. It's just a matter of which era of business terminology you're in. <laughs> we have a return of cat. Oh my god, <laughs> what? <laughs> He's addicted to being with the humans. He is. For whatever terminology you want to use, the same point, the, the same underlying structure is there. These are some sort of metric, typically a number, sometimes like a, a qualitative event, yes, no, that are used to measure labor. Or whatever form of labor it is applies to, the same underlying principles kind of happen. These come under my purview as the nerd because it's a measurement system. Whatever this is being applied to, it is being applied in order to measure some sort of an outcome. And then that is being used in a kind of political way within a structure of power, material conditions, and labor relations to make... <laughs> yeah, the cat is back, baby. Buddy, you can't... <laughs> this is why I lock about when I do this. So in this episode, we're going to talk a bit about the kind of founding logic of KPIs as a measurement system broadly defined, how that works under capitalism, and then have a look at a bunch of examples to see what sort of pathologies develop within them as measurement systems. I'm going to chime in with my experience of being a KPI measured worker. Mm-hmm. I, Like I said, listener, at the start, I actually have thoughts about this. I actually have some... You have thoughts? Potential... All right, thanks. I actually have some potentially bad salient comments. I don't recommend thinking. All right, so first off, we're going to talk about KPIs. And you start down that road, you end up doing mathematics. Yeah, I know. As a measurement system. This seems pretty straightforward. You're at the dick-sucking factory. How many dicks have you... Oh, sorry, they wanted less dick content. Um, you're, at the... you're at the cat padding factory. You're at the cat padding factory. How many cats have you padded? How many cats have you padded? So that yeah. seems pretty simple. Since the first boss employed the first worker to make stuff on their behalf, bosses have measured labor output. I mean... Originally, this was dick sucked at the dick sucking factory, mm-hmm. but it, it like has developed since then because it's relatively easy in manufacturing and similar. Yeah. The number of objects produced in a, in a period of time is quite easy, quite materially measurable. Mm-hmm. Right? Well, also, you have like influential works in the start of the 1900s and late 1800s, like Taylor's Principles of Scientific Management, I believe, is the book, mm, which yeah, was like, yeah, yeah. highly, highly influential in this kind of stuff. Yeah, so the underlying kind of, I guess, ideological structure of this is that kind of rationalist economics approach to things. Mm-hmm. 
in that original book, was there much skull measuring, Bart, do you think? <laughs> I think the skull measuring was more I implied. The idea of sci like the principles of scientific measurement just sounds so fucking ominous as a book title. <laughs> yes, absolutely it does. That's but a... this is the principles of scientific measurement of labour output. Somebody fucking died for, for that book. Scientific too. management, it's actually There you called. go, scientific management. Interestingly, also employed in the Soviet Union. Both Lenin and Stalin now. I'm, I'm a fan well. now, actually. That's actually <laughs> now it sounds actually good. So as soon as you start introducing ideas around safety, things get harder to measure. We'll get to safety as a specific case later on. But it's worth thinking about the way that our approach to labour has changed and the way that even like material products are different to what they once were and the output is measured differently. Once we get to things like white collar jobs, it starts getting harder to try to move beyond a task or time-based system. So customer satisfaction as an idea is really last like 20 or so years that that's really exploded. Uh, it used to just be kind of assumed that when you sold stuff that meant you had a satisfied customer, but into the tw 21st century rather than the 20th, I suppose, the uh, 2000s rather than the 1900s, as I have rather upsettingly called them to somebody in the past. Different ways of rationalizing output and performance kind of came to the fore. Also, like, huge portions of the economy were kind of, by that time, completely transferred over into more email-based jobs, right? Oh, yeah, absolutely. And there had to be, and, like, one of the transformations of labor that goes into building KPIs is bullshit jobs. And I would say that before the explosion of, like, computer jobs, having a bullshit job was much less common because you just couldn't kind of create bullshit jobs so easily. Whereas now, there's so many of them as a way of kind of forcing people to turn the big capital lever to make the, the money go around, but also to occupy people in a form of labor that can be seen as monetarily productive, even if it's not actually productive. Yeah, it's a busy box. Yeah. The more abstract things get, so the further you get from doing something like that affects a specific thing, producing something, the harder it is to really measure it properly, and the worse and less under the worker's control those measurement systems tend to be. Dear listener, if you wanna if you wanna learn about the violence of abstraction, I recommend literally any postmodernist novel from the nineteen sixties and seventies. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, or uh, just do your email job and you'll experience the violence <laughs> of abstraction. <laughs> yeah, I was gonna say, I don't think anybody listening to this actually needs exposure to that idea. <laughs> mm -hmm. Once things are made measurable, even if the numbers are bullshit, they can be optimized. And to the capitalist, of course, that optimizing means they are used as a tool to discipline labor. So at some point, whatever KPI system you have, it will be used to determine if somebody keeps their job or not. So somebody's livelihood will depend on those numbers. Even before that point, though, bad KPIs can have a really, really negative effect on the working conditions of people and their experience, both at home and at work, depending on how these things manifest. Mm -hmm. They are also used to ratchet up production by setting targets above existing levels. This is part of that rationalizing sort of assumption that there is always room for the line to go up. There is always space for some sort of labor process to be made more efficient. I'm making air quotes here. Whatever that means, and typically what that means is crushing labor costs as much as possible. Well, not just crushing labor costs, but claiming as an item of the, uh, claiming as an asset of the company the workers increased efficiency. Yes. Like we're all familiar with the idea that uh, the the benefits of automation are not evenly distributed. Yeah. If um, you can pat more cats at the pat catting factory, you don't uh, have to work half the time. Uh, you just have to pat twice as many cats. Yeah. With KPIs, I think one of the key things they do is provide a um, structure for taking the increasing skill and efficiency of a worker mm. and saying, no, you, you this means you must work exactly as hard for longer because we have produced these KPIs. Businesses will often say that increases in KPIs have come from work done by a manager or mm. new management tools that have been put in place, etc. It's a way of saying, oh, you've gotten very good at doing your eight hours work in two hours. Well, that was actually us helping you. So you'd better go back and do six hours more work. 
even yeah. though the um the reality um, is the whips have gotten bigger yeah exactly but i think that my refrain over the course of this entire episode will be that it's it's a way of disguising the um these extractive relationships with white collar jobs mm. I'm going to center the rest of this episode basically around bad examples and the pathologies that arise from them. These often overlap and in fact interact and stack. So you'll often have a, a particular KPI or a, a particular KPI system, which has a whole bunch of, a lot of bad shit going on, all of which is mixed together and built upon each other to become something truly horrific and oppressive. The examples I'm going to use are sourced from various people I know and have talked to. I have asked their permission to use these, and I'm not going to put in the kind of detail that would make them identifiable. I am, of course, assuming that they are telling me the truth. Now, I am willing, more than happy to believe that these are real examples because I, you know, I talk to people about them and I, I have seen multiple accounts of similar sort of structures. Mm -hmm. But a lot of so a lot of the pushback against criticism of these KPI systems is to say, oh, nobody would do that. Yeah. It's, it's like saying, oh, nobody would use child labor, so we don't need laws against child labor. <laughs> and here we are, we keep seeing this is child labor, don't we? If they didn't want to work in the mines, they shouldn't yearn for them. <laughs> exactly, yeah. From our bad examples, from our kind of, I guess, taxonomy of the, the bad shit that can happen with KPIs, we're going to think about, well, if you have, are going to measure stuff, which I don't think is an inherently bad thing, Yeah. how can you do something that's better, and particularly how can you do something that is better from the perspective of the workers that are subjected to it? So our first pathology is abusive or exploitative thresholds. This is where you go to buy enough uh, V-Bucks to buy one Fortnite skin, but you can only buy... There have been lots that let you buy one and a half Fortnite skins. How can you buy half a Fortnite skin? Well, you can't. That's why oh, you I have see. to go okay. up to the next tier. Kind of. Okay. So what I'm thinking about here is that whatever is being measured, the level at which it is considered successful for a period of time is unrealistic. So this is one of those productivity ratchets. And this is kind of the, the most basic entry-level form of... Yeah, this, this existed long before the logic of KPIs, right? Yeah. yeah. You forever had a higher um, level of stuff that you needed to produce. If you got that, well, the level's raised again, you have to write a quota. Sorry, that's the term. Yeah, yeah. So if you, if you did 20, next week you've got to do 30 or whatever else. It's a way of forcing more and more productivity out of the worker, inevitably for no more or you perhaps even less actual pay yeah dig the best stitches get given a bigger shovel etc yeah, yeah yeah these may or may not be set up in a way where you have like a threshold which is gets a pass and a higher threshold where you actually get a reward for exceeding expectations or whatever yeah in some instances they are in those cases it may well be that the baseline is achievable but the higher threshold to get a material award just never would be. But it's there to, for management to go, what are you complaining about? We're offering you these bonuses. You're just not achieving high enough to get them. Yeah, when I um, was doing tech support, we were trained on how to use like a gamified KPI thing. And yeah. if you won, you could buy swag off the company store. <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's sickening. And they said, it's just little bonuses. Like you guys are going to be doing this sort of stuff anyway. They ended up discontinuing it. I think inside of like a year and a half, just because the it was just so bleak as a concept. It's fucking insulting. Like. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I, I mean, I did win a, a cool backpack, but that's. that's <laughs> <beside> the <point>. <laughs> <laughs> I don't reckon the backpack is anywhere close to the actual added value. No, like, that's and that's the thing. I, but and to go back to the thing I'm going to harp on is that this is a way of disguising the increasing extraction of yeah, yeah, yeah. of worker labor. And if you're in tech support, there is something of a of a product which is that you you close issues right it's service but you are you do have a, a a tangible incoming amount of stuff that has to be labored upon to produce the the outcome and i found that these sort of kpis where the kpis are, are too high i'd say this is the, like the least deft like this is obviously bad and, and evil but i think that as we get on and i start telling some more stories as i said when, when you first wrote down this is really the, sort of the base level they've gotten more sophisticated but ultimately only by adapting the same kind of yeah. ex exploitive systems that we're in a factory or in, you know a oh yeah and and so much of the kpi system is kind of adopting those factory level ideas to white collar labor like it is a huge push at the white collar level to the proletarianization 
of professional jobs. I was going to say, without pretending to be more working class or whatever than I am, I do work a blue collar job and the KPIs there do not tend to have the carrot, just the stick, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they, they manifest in radically different ways across different sectors. I find it interesting how the kind of quota terminology that was the blue collar job setting right you would be told you have to complete this many things as as, like an explicit quota how that has been transformed and kind of adopted this white collar kpi language and i think that some of that is kind of middle management creeping towards to get its fingers into everything and also justify its own existence through the use of these kpis but the only language that they understand is built around these kpis so of course they're going to start using them everywhere and but I would say that in my example about the gamified thing, people don't like the carrot is too condescending. Like sure. they end up taking it away. And the the existence of like the carrot nominally in terms of bonuses and progression in terms of KPIs, that's ultimately just a stick with a smile, which is saying yeah. there's a certain part of your salary that we're going to we're going to yeah. legally hold back if you don't meet this number, right? So yeah, it makes sense. It's got the the the, the smiling happy face of the boss who wants to. Be like your dad, but ultimately he's, <laughs> he's there to spank you. So some of the examples that I heard about in this were um, people who work in like consulting jobs or s- some sort of job where you get billable hours. Were you expected to do billable hours of way too high a level in terms of a proportion of your working week, way higher than you actually had as incoming work, so there was no way for you to meet that threshold. In call centres, I talked to a couple of people who work in those, and the one of their key metrics is the average call duration, and that was often set way too low to actually get the job done. So you would have in- you would incentivize things like hanging up on people who were calling you in order to keep that number down. Last one, which oh I, I I fucking hate this one so much, but it shows up all over the time is customer satisfaction ratings. Ah. So oh I, oh I hate them so much, man. Like we're going to talk about how they work as a mathematical construction in a bit, but in general you have this idea of a rating system based on customer satisfaction where you get feedback from customers. It is eventually transformed into some sort of a number, usually between like 1 and 5 or 1 and 10 or whatever. And often what you will find is that satisfaction is treated as like the very highest rank only, or maybe like 9 and 10 out of a 10 point scale. Yeah, typically it's called top box. So 5 on a 1 to 5 and 9 and 10 if you're doing a, a 10 scale. Yeah, whereas a unsatisfied is like six and under on the 10 point scale or three, two or one on a five point scale. And okay, I guess is like a a four or a seven or eight. And what this is doing is it's treating average, which I mean, three on a five point scale would say, yeah, that's average, right? It's treating average as a failure. So typically in these sorts of environments, if you get too many of those kind of unsatisfied ratings, you lose your job. Whereas those don't necessarily represent an unsatisfied person. It's just that the threshold of success set by the KPI is disconnected from the reality of what you're doing and disconnected from the reality of the feedback that you get. I would say that this is somewhat distorted by what what basically emerges as, I hesitate to point to Black Mirror and say they got anything right, but in the episode where there's the the social ranking system. Yeah, yeah. And everyone does that. I remember the main character, she goes to a counsellor who wants to get her ranking up. She says, but I get lots of 10s. He says, but those are all reciprocal 10s from other other service people. And I'm like, that's so on point because <laughs> oftentimes you will give a 10 to a service person, even if you know they did a shit job, because there's a, there's a cultural understanding. Would you of say this... perhaps a worker solidarity? Yeah, there is, there's a, there is a solidarity where it's like, I would... Even if somebody gave him the most dog shit service imaginable, yeah. I'm giving him a fucking 10. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so I think that management has sort of learned to adapt to this. Well, sorry, there's another thing to point to that. And just that that's part of why the numbers are so high is because they're trying to stay ahead of this solidarity movement. And the second thing is, is ultimately they don't give a fuck about the actual results because if you are a paid service, like if you are paid tech support, we yeah. were premier support. So people paid to have us as their support team. You just want to be able to say, we are we have the maximum rating from this accreditation agency, mm. which looks at your top box numbers. So your ability to produce these numbers yeah. is like, you just need to be able to jump through the hoops, do this worker solidarity thing and milk enough tens 
so that we can say to our customers, yeah, you're paying for AAA support service. It's such a it's such a weirdly kind of incestuous parasitic system. <laughs> yeah, the entire the entire fucking white collar professional software as a service model is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's funny what you, your experiences in the economy are like, though. Like my brother is a professional football player. I once mm. just offhand said, "Oh, I've never given an Uber driver less than five stars," and he was like, "Oh, but." Isn't it like reward for effort? It's like, oh, you've got no idea, mate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, absolutely. Like people come, I always make sure to fill out any survey I'm given because I know that someone's being excoriated for those and they, they go a long yeah. way. But well, the last thing I wanted to say on customer satisfaction is- Oh, we'll come back to it. Don't worry. There'll be oh, more opportunities. Oh, sure. But I, one thing I also wanted to get as well is that with customer satisfaction, it hasn't clicked in my head exactly how, but I feel that there's something critically important happening that the relationship between management and labor has added this third party of customer satisfaction, which is nominally controllable by the performance of the laborer, but as we've discussed, ultimately is used for bizarre and perverse purposes and is influenced by these outside factors. And I feel like it ultimately, because these things are unattainable and so random, they give a fiat ability to discipline and dismiss labor because of these random occurrences that you can then um, decide to employ or not yeah, at yeah. your discretion. Absolutely. So one of the uses of abusive thresholds is basically to have a lever that you can pull any time to fire somebody if they piss you off yeah. for whatever reason. And I think that uh, this is particularly useful if you are trying to break an organizing effort because you don't have to say, oh, we fired these people because you were organizing. You can just say we fired them because they weren't meeting their KPIs over this period of time. Yeah. Well, also half of this shit seems like management fads anyway. Like, Oh, absolutely. Like, oh, when yeah, I first I'm started gonna, my I'm job, get they it. used to do customer surveys and they used to like bring around them and like tell you if you got like a high one or a low one or whatever. They don't do that anymore. It's just kind of like, fell off like so in your job as a postie i feel like customer satisfaction is rather disconnected from your actual job, oh sure i guess um, and, and this is one of the things we'll come to but like did your mail arrive today <laughs> i realize that i'm probably like taking a incredible reductive view of, of what you're actually doing but like to me that is people's actual experience interacting with the mail most of the time oh for sure and but i don't know it, the other like twist of it is like if you have like a lot of elderly people and you're around or whatever, you often do a bit of chatting because like you're the only person they talk to every day or whatever, but they are the least likely to answer a survey that's come off your scanner, you know? <laughs> but- <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> no, you, well, and in my job doing customer support, what you found, and again, this is another discussion about how these, these numbers end up, end up being meaningless, is that you would learn which customers would give good surveys and remind them about the survey. <laughs> Whereas you would selectively not remind the people who were grumpy or who just dissatisfied for other reasons. Yeah. yeah. And so the, the number ends up being this this absolute crock. I, yeah, I'm, I'm going to go on at length about it, but I want to let Tess get to <laughs> Oh, don't worry. I'll give you the it. opportunity to talk about that stuff. So the second pathology I want to talk about is like a, a very statistical one, which is bad averaging or summary metrics. So this is another one of, like, it depends on what you're measuring as to what sort of averaging you can do. But on the whole, what is being measured may in the instant be fine. Like, measuring your output as a somebody producing something might be quite reasonable. But how that is stacked up to look at, like, summary statistics over a particular period of time can introduce really, really pathological shit. The example that I'm going to talk about here is that if we take an average or a total over a week vs total each day yeah so let's say calls taken or cases closed yeah or welds done or letters delivered right, or right. whatever right so whatever you want to measure this is a task based metric you have some count of tasks and you are either taking I'm, i've put average slash total over the week on the same side of this because to me they are mathematically equivalent if you say you have to do 100 in a week that's equivalent to saying 100 divided by 5 on average each day i mean the averaging process what it means to take an average is you add up everything you got in the week and then divide by the number of days if you look at a total each day this would be equivalent to saying you have to do 20 each day if you are setting that total at the day level there is no real allowance for variation so if what you actually observe is let's say um 
Oh God, I'm going to have to make up some numbers here real quick. So we go 15, 20, 25, 10, 15, 20, 25, 10. So that should be 30. 30. You've gone up by fives? No, 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 no. I'm not going up. This is like Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. I got that. I was I was just pretending you've done <laughs> and you've, you've taken that as a, yeah. Um, <laughs> sorry, backup joke. You didn't make up any of those numbers. I've seen them before. Well done. But, yeah, give me, but, uh, how would you rate your satisfaction of that joke? <laughs> Oh, I so would say please keep in mind I will be shot in the head if I <laughs> is less than a nine. Well, this is why you are also at the podcasting KPI performance management. Oh, seminar, I see. Right? right. Yeah, you were the one making all the dick jokes. So I'm the one sleep asleep up the back, but I should be paying more attention. Right. Yeah. This is a hundred total over the week. The average would be twenty per day, right? But if we go by the total, each day has to be fifty. Has to be twenty. Sorry. This one and this one are below that threshold. So that looks like a 40% failure rate on your KPIs. That's 90 total. Got it, ladies and no, gentlemen. No, no, it's not. No, it's not. <laughs> See, five off that goes to there. That's 60. Yes. That's 40. 60 plus 40 is 100. Oh, fuck. <laughs> Got him, ladies and gentlemen. Why did I think the last one was a 20? Because you can't read. Oh, because you can't write. It's your fault. I'm blaming you. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, right. my handwriting is not part of the KPIs for this podcast. <laughs> Carry on. <laughs> this is why I don't question the numbers, Dean. It's not because I'm too No, dumb. no, I want you to question the numbers, <laughs> please. My, my arithmetic is bad enough that I think somebody else should check. It doesn't matter if their arithmetic is as bad as mine. Together we will come to an answer. <laughs> but on the whole, right, this person has done the average or the total of the week, but they haven't met the total every day. And one of the people that I talked to about this stuff actually had this happen to them. What was a weekly total target became kind of micromanaged to the day, and then people started looking like they were failing, even if over the whole week they were still meeting those targets. So part of this is a reflection of the fact that your measurement process evolves over time. You're, you are taking repeated measurements with KPIs. And if you are building a KPI system, you have to, well, if you are trying to build a KPI system well, in a manner that reflects the labor process and is useful to workers, whatever else, you have to care about this stuff. Because your summary and averaging constructions have a meaning that relates directly to what is being done. Also, a struggle is that if you're a worker who I mean, even within a day, yeah, works at a particular pace. So like when I was working my customer service job, I was not on decent medication for attention deficit. So the way I would work is that I would, because you were waiting literally for a blaring alarm to go off, I just sat there sort of in a panic, taking these calls and doing sort of the initial triage. Then at the end of the day, when productivity dropped off, I would blitz through and do most of the, the casework and everything. So I would end up with a, with a clearance rate per day that was the same as my peers, but I would end up through most of the day, people asking, hey, are you going to get to this? Like, and it became quite stressful. If you're somebody who works even within a day at a cadence that isn't like expected, if you have any variability, variability, then, uh, or any, I hesitate to say like, Disability? Dis disability. Because I, I, I don't think my brain is as a disability, but in this context, it is, right? Well, I mean, this is the social model of disability, right? Right, yeah. Yeah. I don't think there's anything wrong with my brain, but there's, there's nothing is, good about my brain for support for that kind of work. Well, no, the style of the work, shall we say, is ill accustomed to the way your brain works. I right, think. and that's yeah. what I'm saying. Like these these KPI systems, because they're they're ultimately concerned with um, maximizing productivity for the capitalist system. Yeah, you know the, the metric ends up being exclusionary to anybody who doesn't fit a, a quite a narrow model of work, not just model of of productivity level. Yeah, and also like from a statistical standpoint, as single number representations as averages or totals or something that is unable to deal with natural variation mm -hmm. and this is one of like I, I talk on this podcast at length repeatedly about the fact that that kind of what single number single dimensional analysis or something is very lacking because you always expect to see some variability and like the inability of these metrics to account for that I mean an average over a period of time is better than an average or than a total over a day. Like that is able to account for variability, but it's still not looking at the variability and asking where is it happening and why. 
And if you want to go like deep Marxist law on it, the major change is the kind of uh, movement towards like from sort of people who are self-employed making their own shit, which you could do however your brain kind of fitted into it as long as like you produce the thing, the for thing the customer was made, yeah. to the model of proletarianization that happens in the sort of sort of 17th to the 19th century where it becomes mechanized you know well so much of this is basically treating a worker and their labor like it is a piece of a machine yeah and the machine has tolerances and you have to work within those tolerances as opposed to the worker's ability to produce and the variation in what they produce is, like, central, I guess, or, like, an inextricable part of having people involved in this process. Mm. So work built around that rather than around packing people into these boxes to demand that they work in line with the machine's tolerances is, like, better for the workers. Yes. Yeah. I stand here as an example. I moved from doing work for an agency or company to doing freelance stuff. And under a freelance arrangement, I have a contract of deliverables that I have to deliver within a certain amount of time, but I get to decide how I go about providing those. It's it's obviously a very privileged position. I'm very happy to have it, but it takes that, you know, no, I don't have to answer to fucking KPIs. My life is a thousand times better for it. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. One other way that you can have this sort of bad averaging or summary is that you are looking at very, very different types of work and trying to measure them in the same way. The call center example I mentioned before had this involved there. This was a call center where you had calls that could range from password reset request to extensive policy advice. And measuring those to the same average call length sort of metric is insane because there's no way like a two minute call hey could you please reset my password is in any way measurable or equivalent to half an hour to an hour long discussion about policy yeah and also there's no allotment if you're just saying calls yeah and time taken on calls there's no allowance for and indeed i think a hostility towards Calls that take the extra time to prevent future calls. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Because one of the things that we have, I know I'm talking a lot about personal experience, but... Um, I, oh, don't worry, I'm getting to academic stuff in a second. <laughs> <laughs> we were, the support job I was doing, um, we were the Australian team of an international company. We had really, really good customer review scores, but long, longer case solve times. And our workload was decreasing. And we were constantly being told we had to clear more cases because we weren't keeping up and people were saying that um, our we were uh, winning awards internal to the company because we were performing very well in terms of customer satisfaction. But I think that if all you think about is, okay, they're getting less cases, which makes it easy to get the customer satisfaction, but they're taking longer, they don't have to work as hard, right? That ignores the fact that one of the things we were doing was taking the time to educate customers so they didn't have to come back. Mm. We, uh, we literally had a couple of initiatives around um, like mentoring sessions where we would sit down for half an hour to take them through a particular piece of the, the puzzle so that they, they didn't have to do that. But if you are being measured on the amount of things you cleared, this is act actively detrimental. Yeah, absolutely. You're literally like putting yourself out of work here. Mm -hmm. It's the same thing what we're talking about is if the worker's skill increases, these KPIs will just rise to match. And also you're actively decreasing the quality of your product or the, the service you're providing if you hold people to these standards. Because as I've just pointed out, right? If you take more time, which is bad if that's, that's a metric, to prevent more cases, then that's bad because cases closed is your metric, right? You're just applying this, this growth model to a system in which ultimately, if it's anything to deal with human interactions, you know, positively, if you do a good job, you should have less of them. Yeah. The suicide hot <laughs> prevention hotline <laughs> likes, should aim to have, no, aim calls. To have no calls. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But well, I fucking bet you they've got some stupid KPI. Well, this is also like, we're going to talk more about safety in a second, but you can't measure events that don't happen. Yeah, yeah. So that makes it antithetical to this kind of KPI measurement logic. Right. That's, yeah. If that call center is contracted out by another company, they want people coming back because they yeah. measure their output in like in services done. Yeah. Like. So th there are these perverse incentives to all this sort of thing. Okay. I, I, I need to get hang to on. this next point because. Hang on. We're driven by the profit motive here. There can't be perverse <laughs> incentives. Oh, <laughs> that's true. That's true. I now get to bitch about my lived experience, which is that publication rates across different academic fields are like measuring the call duration across these different examples. So uh, a publication rate is used as a metric to look at what you're doing as an academic in terms of research. It stinks. It is just like 
it is even more disconnected from the quality of our work than average call duration is from whatever they were doing. Even within a field, you could have radically different sort of things, and like the quality of work is not at all connected to how often you're producing it. So in maths, for example, a paper that you have written can take years to get through the review process and actually be published. That is radically different to something in like medical radiation physics, which can be like a three week turnaround. So if you have the physicists and the mathematicians in the same school or in the same like faculty, you're going to look at the physicists, the, these med rad physicists and the mathematicians and say, well, the mathematicians are producing shit because their publication rates are so low. When in actuality, both fields are probably producing at the rate that they should be, quote unquote, within the fields. It's just they're not measuring the same sort of thing. You also have radically different methodologies that go into produce papers. So papers based on years of data collection are very different to something that takes existing data and then does analysis on it. To compare the two is meaningless on the broader scale there. So that's that's my rant about academic working conditions for the day. I'm sure I'll have some more of them. We're on to the next pathology, unless you guys have another one you want to cook up for the second. I'm sure we may be able to draw it back in later. In a previous episode, we talked about scientific whimsy, where yes. you just, for the hell of it... That's a bonus episode for those of you not on the Patreon. Where, for the hell of it, somebody with the most unwashed penis imaginable decides <laughs> to just embark... The that's, a joke, that's a joke dick. from the episode. This is the most unsucked episode. dick, not the most unwashed <laughs> dick. Well, I mean, yeah. There's um, a correlation. There's a correlation. Um, <laughs> we were talking about scientific whimsy, where somebody embarks upon something for the, the pure joy of or of curiosity, etc. And it seems to me that quotas for the production of published papers is like the exact opposite of scientific whimsy. Oh my god, yes. <laughs> it's, it's like scientific misery. It's scientific depression. Oh yeah. And it's so bad because it incentivizes all kinds of unethical sort of stuff. I mean, I have talked about p-hacking before on this podcast, but broadly, these this is a form of, I guess, scientific pathology, let's call it that way, that is a response to the fact that you have to publish to keep your job, which is that you will massage your data to make it more likely, or to make it produce a statistically significant, that is, you prove something or show evidence of something result, yeah. and then you can publish that, because for a very long time, publication, it's changing now, but publications have required that you have some positive result to report. People only do that because their jobs are under threat. Mm -hmm. And that's bad for everybody involved. Yeah. I don't know if it fits under this. When I first started my job, about like three months in or whatever, you had to do a test to check your indoor time throw-off rates. What's that? So in the morning when you get in, you'll have like boxes and boxes of letters and you sort them out onto a frame. Then you right. scan in all your parcels and you order those on the frame so that like when you're out on the road like you're delivering them in the right order you know right okay so this is basically making it so you don't have to sort through everything while you're yes, on the road yes absolutely but it was broken down into um all the components of it so you've got the standard letters you've got the unsorted letters you've got the big letters and you've got the parcels mm. and i failed one when i was the first out of the building oh <laughs> As in, like, you you were too slow, or...? Apparently, on several of the measurements, I was too slow, even though I was the fastest. In I was the first... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right, okay. <laughs> that is a bit strange. Absolutely. So that just says that the threshold was... Fucked. Yes, and yeah. possibly that some of the targets in the mix weren't uh, particularly smartly calibrated, I would say. Yeah, yeah. Let's get on to this next pathology, which is number three. So the next one is KPIs measure something not under the worker's control. Like customer satisfaction. Yes. Yeah, we had a guy who um would give us an, a negative rating on every single case because he didn't want to be using the product, but his manager was making him use it. Yeah. So customer satisfaction is, in fact, the first one on this list, basically because like so much of what goes into a customer being happy is out of the workers' control. It may be something as simple as the customer wants something that is not offered by the company. Yeah. It may it may be something like they just have a shit day and you haven't made their day great, so they think that you made their day bad. Or whatever policies the company has. And this is one of the reasons that like customer help centers and customer call centers are some of the most God awful like work because it's just basically being there to cop abuse from people who are unhappy. Yeah, we were taught uh, that uh, customers have certain uh, types and needs, which is basically like how to respond like a like a battered wife to the particular uh, pathologies of 
yeah. of you. It's like somebody. sometimes people just need to get stuff out of their system, which is a nice way of saying management expects you to grin and be yelled at. <laughs> I mean, that's far less patronising than what we get sometimes, which is, is your mood in the red or in the black? We need you to... We need you to get your move <laughs> into the red while you're out dealing with customers. So one particularly uh, pathological example of this that I saw was a customer satisfaction ranking applied to people doing painful and invasive tests in hospitals. <laughs> so, like, no joke, they were going up to somebody in a hospital bed and doing these various tests on them and potentially very serious condition, and then the customer was asked if they were happy with the servers. <laughs> 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 yeah another one is like around sales targets and billable hours Salespeople don't control demand so it is often very difficult for a salesperson to go out and find new clients if there isn't demand for what they are doing and mm-hmm. to some extent this is the expectation that salespeople will create demand for their product but that doesn't always work and not nearly as much as like the sellers like to think that's why when you go to the mall people doing either like selling for charities or fucking paintball or whatever are so fucking aggressive (laughs) yes absolutely in the realm of software as a service right you're trying to get a business to sign up to a hundreds of thousands of dollars or millions of dollar subscription to a particular software platform that you're saying will improve their profitability profitability or something and this is very incestuous like each one each one of these is themselves signed up to dozens of other businesses etc etc but often what happens is the sales teams there are just exhausting unexplored market interest in the product and they change jobs constantly what they i mean they get paid a commission their idea is that like their sales ability is what's really good ultimately what they take from job to job is the list of people they know will buy their stuff yeah will buy their stuff if they try to sell them something new yeah and so everyone is aware of how it works right they have these massive exclusivity contracts when they leave a business and then they'll like go work in some other industry for a while before they come back before it expires because everyone knows this is how it functions but the entire charade requires this belief through kpis and whatnot that we pretend that this this isn't how it functions Mm -hmm. so another one that i found like talking to people who do support jobs or, or stuff past the point of sale so support being a primarily primary one of those is that you don't control the billable hours that you do because if your support somebody else is dealing with the number of clients coming in the door you just kind of receive them and then work with them this is another thing that comes out under contracting where you have the sales team is separate to the people who actually do the contracting work so if if your billable hours are tied to the performance of the salespeople, you have no control over that and that that can be really quite stressful and disorienting as well I, I found a particularly ghoulish instance of these sales targets, which was in a pharmacy. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I won't identify the person or the country or the business, but it was a pharmacy and there was a scandal about them introducing these sales targets that led to people pushing products on customers. Yeah, fentanyl. Definitely something that uh, you want to gen demand for. <laughs> uh, see, I think, I yeah, think yeah, fentanyl yeah. was less pushed on people. I think... You really want oxycodone for that shit, hey? Yeah, they started on the oxycodone, and then when it got withdrawn, they went to the phone. Right, okay, fair enough. Uh, Next pathology, which is number four, is uh, disconnected from quality of work, or volume of work, if you like. Uh, This is quite closely related to pathology three, because if something is disconnected from the quality of your work, it's probably not under your control. Yeah, yeah. But this is like a, a kind of special case, I think. So the first example I want to talk about is going to rely on me actually getting some images onto this that I forgot to put on earlier. Ooh, statistics are now code? Oh, it gets worse. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm less, I'm less hawkish on this one because it means you can do a shit job and just meet the, the bullshit numbers and... <laughs> uh, well, this is the thing, right? How bullshit the numbers are matters, I guess, <laughs> is the point there. If something doesn't measure what you do, it can be very hard to meet the bullshit numbers. Sure. So it does become a real issue. Okay, this example is some code I have written. All these three bits of code do the same thing, up to the fact that this longest one on the right would only account for three different individuals. These other ones can do an arbitrary number. Notice that there are different numbers of lines of code here. Mm. The 12 is probably a bit shorter than you'd want because it's got very little information in it that, like, no comments to say what bits are. The 22 has a bunch of comments, these 
slightly grayed out things with the hash at the front that are explaining what the bits of the code are doing. And the 38 is just repeating the same code time after time because it makes it longer. This sort of stuff shows up if you give a programmer a KPI related to the lines of code they write. And I'm immediately reminded, I know we don't like to talk too much about Mr. Musk on this podcast because it'll go on forever, <laughs> but I'm immediately reminded of his asking all the programmers to give him a printout of everything they'd written. Oh my fucking like how God, much that code was so have funny. You, have you for, the, for Twitter? <laughs> it's Twitter! You fucking idiot! Oh, whatever. Well, also, like, length of code does not correlate to quality. Yeah, I mean, we you've got an example yeah, right Yeah, exactly, there. right here. I would probably go for this one in the middle, particularly if I was showing anybody else because it's got some explanation. But if you tell me that my pay depends on the length, I am writing out every single fucking line of this. Yeah. I'm annotating every single fucking line. I could make this 300 lines long and it would do the same thing and be no more meaningful, but I get fucking pay. This is why in the contracts I do for freelancing, I specifically mentioned that any of my deliverables will be optimized for, for like directness and brevity, etc. AKA, I don't have to pad these fucking numbers. <laughs> if, <laughs> yeah. it's, if it's short, that's because you did have a complex problem. Yes. Other ones like this are in academia, number of papers published is a particularly bad one. In, in industries that produce physical things, numbers of items produced when done at the cost of quality can be a particular one of that because yeah. like you can rush production of all kinds of things and get a shit product out at the end mm -hmm. if all you're looking at is the number of objects that you're gonna screw it up i mean if you look at the uh, various statistics around luxury apartment production in australia in the last 20 years that's exactly <laughs> what you see yeah yeah i can i can get my uh my time to case closed down really well if i just say sorry that feature's not supported. And just lie, and then just close the case. <laughs> that's great. Yeah, I mean, that's you only do that for particularly difficult customers, right? <laughs> <laughs> Our next pathology is what we might call um, pathological incentives. No. Mm. We just talked about numbers going up, number of production things going up, producing bad quality. That's not only like a bad thing that you might get out, it can be potentially very, very dangerous. I mean, people die when buildings collapse for example, or when medical devices fail or when drug production goes wrong. So that can be very, very dangerous, even for the people doing the work. Forcing people to work faster in, in industrial settings leads to bad outcomes. For residents in aged care homes, forcing people to have more and more residents because the number of residents is good for the profitability of the aged care home, and fuck, I hate that we make <laughs> it profitable. That's a perverse incentive that lowers the quality of the care. If your average call duration is the metric for your call center, you're going to hang up on people, even if they desperately need your help. This, to me, was particularly brought home. One of the people I talked to worked with a disability employment services provider here in Australia. So this is part of our welfare system. If you are on a disability pension here, you may still be expected to look for work in some form. Notionally, it should be aligned with your disability, so you should not be asked to do things that you can't do, or that would be dangerous or hurt hurtful for you to do. And notionally, it is aimed at getting you into long-term work and out of the welfare system. However, these disability employment service providers are private companies. How they make their money is that you get a client on board, a client being somebody from, from with a disability pension who comes to you supposedly for support, and you send them off to do various things. You might provide services for them by helping them with resumes or interviews, whatever else. The main way that you get money out of this is that they get placed in a workplace for some period of time. You get paid as the disability employment services provider when they are there initially, when they have been there for three months, and when they have been there for six months. After they are there for six months, you don't get paid anymore and they will get re removed from your system as a client. So what this means is that the most financially rewarding thing to do is to cycle these people through short-term, usually three-month placements that they are never going to be able to continue in, or that the person on the other end, the employer, doesn't want them to continue in because they are benefiting from these short-term sort of contracts. You wind up having these, these people on disability pensions, and the same thing happens to unemployed people more generally, cycling through maybe a dozen or so of these short-term contracts, because that's how you maximize the profit that you get from them being there. There is no incentive structurally to actually get them into permanent work. Hmm. There is no incentive to support their well-being, because 
it's much better for you if they keep that job for a little bit and then drop out because they get fired or they can't do the work or whatever else and then come back to you to continue as a client. So this is a really perverse incentive in that system. And then the people working in the disability employment service provider are going to have their own KPIs built around maximizing that profit more than they are going to have around actually helping people get long-term jobs. That sucks. That's not just a KPI thing, though. That That is this that oh, is no, a state a- where like unemployment is essential to an economy to a capitalist econ- economy, but at the same time, yep, like, absolutely, and this is <laughs> it has to be punished. This is a particular parasitic structure that has grown up around the unemployment uh, support services in Australia, which absolutely suck. And I have ranted. I mean, we've had episodes with people from the um, Unemployed Workers Union and people who have done stuff like campaign against Robo Debt. So uh, go back and have a look at those if you want to hear more about how fucked our system is. But you were saying, you know, that doesn't necessarily relate to KPIs. I bet you my fucking bottom dollar that the KPIs of the people working in those systems are aligned to produce the outcomes that happen to be maximally profitable for the business. So, right, their, their KPIs won't be people settled into happy, productive lives in a job that allows them to better themselves and improve their situation. Their KPIs will be people placed, through. people placed, people who stayed for three months and six months. It's going to align them with that yeah that model yeah absolutely so the person that i talked to about this actually got a lot of long-term placements for her clients because she really tried her best and this is also why she got bullied out but within her company she was not given support and rewarded by those kpis even though the actual like centerlink government level kpis are about getting people off of welfare and getting people out of the employment support system. So there are conflicting KPIs here. There's the KPIs set by the government, which are intended to reflect people leaving the welfare system, which create their own perverse incentives by meaning that if you bully somebody out of welfare because they don't want to tolerate being subjected to your abuse, that counts towards your KPIs. Whereas in this particular setting, the private company doing this disability support services has internal sort of targets about cycling, about how many people you place. And you can place the same person multiple times Mm. and each of those count. There are often, particularly when you have public-private partnerships, overlapping and conflicting systems of these KPIs that all introduce their own preferred incentives. But guaranteed at this point in neoliberalism, if that shit was all run by the government, those KPIs would be exactly the same. Government-run ones were about people moving off of welfare because they had long-term employment. Yeah. That's not the same as you got this person into six one-month six or three-month contracts. Each of those counts. Right. Yeah, so there are, shall we say, slightly better ones, but the long-term employment or people moving off of welfare introduces its own pathologies around kicking people off of welfare. Yeah, that, that's exactly right. It's yeah. the, the neoliberal state is oh, like yeah. some good thing that's been taken over by these horrible private companies. They fucking, you know, my brother in Christ, you hired the company. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You see this at the level of schools as well. So for a lot of schools, they pressure students into choosing easier subjects going to senior school because that way they will get better marks. And then when these students go to university, they may not be able to do the sort of work that they need to that required harder subjects. Or they may have degree programs closed to them that would have required those as prerequisites. Well, I, I went to a very posh private school and their entire value add was that they could get good marks, which is why I was sent a letter at the end of year 11 saying that they do not recommend that I do year 12 easy maths. Yeah. And yet here you are. <laughs> it, it just speaks to what we were talking about previously that, you know, what you were saying, things that don't happen yeah. are hard to measure. Like if you do a really good job educating somebody not just deal if you teach a man to fish you can't be paid to fish for him to fish for him right yeah 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 and this is this applies to every level of this sort of stuff and these kpis what we're talking about are just ways of laundering that uh incentive that this these ancient relations between classes Mm. are now just being uh this system is really quite incredible in that it yes it has no credibility whatsoever it proletary it you know it Proletarianizes. I was going to come, like prol raise <laughs> or something, but it didn't come out quite right. Yeah. It proletarianizes your professional workers 
while having them act more blatantly in the naked interest of the capital class that they're slowly being squeezed out of. Yeah. It's oh, ideologies. <laughs> it's just an incredible well, Also, it's funny, it's funny to think about like that pathology going from like the smallest example to the most giant example. So like the coup government in Bolivia took on an IMF, like a billion dollar IMF loan, which will make them like, uh, which yeah. like will still be there with now that that government has been thankfully defeated that kind of like operates in a very in the exact same dynamic as like one disabled person dealing with like a private company that is like responsible for cycling them into some employment or whatever like yeah it's quite incredible and weird (laughs) yeah i did actually see one example of this pathological incentives which was deeply funny which was a company that let's say they sell two products a and b Executive bonuses are linked to the sale of product A, not to the sale of product B, but product B is both better and more profitable for the company. However, because the executive bonuses are linked to something, they build the KPIs of everybody else in the company to maximize the sale of product A. (laughs) That's particularly funny to me because it screws over the shareholders, realistically. Hmm. But it's also like a, a classic example of how you get these pathologies. And that the KPIs are built to reflect the interests of the executive rather than, I mean, even the interests of the shareholders in that instance. All right, now it's time to talk about safety because safety quantization is a really kind of classic example of this. Safety is really kind of a qualitative thing, right? Yeah, days since last evisceration. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> It's hard to measure because you can't record events that don't happen. That means that a lot of the things people introduce to try and measure the things that didn't happen get really, really fucked up. So if you record the duration without events, your days since last evisceration, you discourage reporting of events. I have a fucking story about this. Ho, ho, ho. Oh, God. <laughs> so someone from high management came down to speak to us all. And uh, Australia Post has like a deal with Amazon, right? Where we deliver their packages and stuff. Oh, God. So yeah. they'd been to a Amazon distribution warehouse in America. Oh, holy fuck. Well, your incident rates and like injury rates are much lower than the Australian mm. example. And then came back and was like, oh, I think like Americans are just like more culturally, like more willing to call out if something has gone wrong or whatever. <laughs> and I was sitting in the back row and I was like, <laughs> no, cunt. It's because we get like work safe if we get injured, whereas they will be fired. <laughs> yes. Oh, amazing. The flip side is that if you measure things like hazard reports and whatever else, you get people creating hazards in order to report them or just inventing silly shit. So I'm going to report an anecdote from the Bunda Vista podcast. One of the hosts there was working in an office job associated with a mining company. And the mine had had some uh, deaths in its mining, the actual like dangerous side of things, do- digging shit up. In order to like inculcate this new safety culture to prevent this happening again, there had been basically KPIs associated with hazard reports applied to the office job. So because it's much easier to do this in an office environment than to actually change the safety equipment and structure of a mine, of course. The particular anecdote given was that at the end of every month, this office job workplace would have a a safety meeting where everybody had to report some number of hazards that they had seen and dealt with, (laughs) which included things like a jumper hanging on the back of an office chair, which could, oh, I don't know, like, fall out, get caught in the wheels and cause somebody to break their necks, or a mug that had been left on a table and could be knocked off and create a slip hazard. Every pathological, silly bullshit you can possibly imagine from the worst hazards in an office environment sort of thing, right? Those were used as a fig leaf to cover for the fact that the actual dangerous job at the mines were not improving their safety. But because this company had made these measurable KPIs around safety across the whole company, including the office jobs, they could use that metric to make it look like they were actually doing better than they were. I would like to denounce my office chair as a member of the Communist Party. (laughs) Uh, Also, my pen holder, Uh uh, the particularly sharp knife in the kitchen. Yeah, you can bring them up on trial. They can report five more hazards each. Mm. Sorry, communists. (laughs) That's that's fucking incredible. I have. Like that. <laughs> yeah, it's great. We should do that around the house. 
<laughs> mm. it fucking has his only to vacuum in here. <laughs> yes. Listener, if you're following along the Dean hasn't vacuumed saga, <laughs> still have it. Still have not vacuumed. <laughs> I put the, the robot vacuum cleaner on a, a bit ago. Okay. So, well, automation, stealing jobs. Yep. All right. I don't pay you to vacuum, though, so. Maybe you should. Maybe the profit motive would. They're not going to have a KPI around. Mate, you own more money than I do. Uh, have a KPI. You charge more per hour, though. So yeah, but <laughs> on a, so taking on a daily scale. Okay, but I, I, I don't get the work that charges at that do- amount per hour. Mm, yeah. Damn, yeah. you guys got the yeah. robot vacuum cleaner. I just go to Kmart and buy a fifty dollar vacuum cleaner every time my old one breaks. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, the Vimes vacuum cleaner theory of economic <laughs> unfairness. All right, our last pathology, and I realize I have kind of given up on writing notes on these. Oh well. This is number six, is a bad use of numbers. There's no such thing. Numbers are neutral. They're not political. Mm. Numbers don't lie. (laughs) Numbers are not always a good representation of things. This is a recurring theme. I guess you could call it somewhat of a raison d'etre of this particular show. Bless you. (laughs) And this extends, of course, to KPIs. If you are going to measure something with a number... You should make an argument as to why that number is useful and relevant. Customer satisfaction bullshit is kind of a classic case of this. We have what we might call a Likert scale of various forms. So let's say it's... Uh, you might uh, call it that. You might. Yeah. I'm Likert at the dick sucking factory. <laughs> <laughs> so you have like unsatisfied. That's unsat. Ugh. Too satisfied. And that's sat. See, you're wasting... This is why we need corporate culture. So you don't have to write as many letters on the thing. Ah, uh, but you see, my uh, KPIs are linked to the duration of the episodes. Oh, I see. Fair yeah. enough. Yeah. Okay, so if we have this 1 to, f- one to 5 scale, you can imagine it being 0 to 10 or 1 to 10, whatever. As typical, these are treated like numbers, but they are, at best, ordered. In the sense that, is the distance between 1 and 2 really the same as the distance between 3 and 4? That's not a meaningful thing to say if you're asking this question. This is why I don't do star ratings on Letterbox. <laughs> Same idea with the star rating, right? The most kind of, I guess, quote unquote, realistic that I've seen is like a a sad face, a neutral face, and a happy face. Most insultingly, I saw this at a fucking petrol station. (laughs) (laughs) It's just like, why? (laughs) Yeah, thanks for the petrol car. Oh, fuck, I've seen that too. Shit, I forgot about that. Yeah, that's something. It's insane, right? Because it's like, petrol's now at like $2.10 a litre. I am viscerally unhappy at being here. And you're making this poor person behind the, the safety glass be subjected to this stupid iPad scale. Anyway, but these are not really numbers. We can't use them like numbers. We can't really take an average of them or whatever else like we would for numbers. But they are treated like numbers for the purpose of middle management who then use it to beat people over the head. What we call a, and this is, Dean, you're going to love this bit, an NPS, a net promoter score. Mm. is closely related to this. So this is one of my favourite examples of kind of corporate (sighs) bullshit. So your net promoter score... Oh, I have got some things to say about the fucking net promoter score. (laughs) So this is kind of a combination of a bunch of different, like, bad pathologies that we've talked about. It's disconnected from the worker's ability to do anything, what it measures is bullshit, the numbers don't really mean numbers, and the um, thresholds are typically set too high. But yet, in about, I think, 2003, 2004, there were a bunch of articles published about this as the one number you need to raise. <laughs> and, like, promoting it as the only KPI you should care about. Before you get ranty, Dean de- de- started Already. to vibrate I'm fucking chair. salivating, <laughs> licking my lips. First of all, we need to base this on a customer satisfaction thing. So we're going to talk about it in context of a 10-point scale, which is that if you rate 1 to 6, you're a detractor. Uh, 7 or 8, you are passive. And 9 to 10, you are considered a promoter. Then your NPS is the percentage promoters minus percentage detractors. And that, of course, everything we've talked about, about who actually answers surveys, who you ask to answer surveys, etc. Yep. etc. This NPS is some number between minus 100, in which case everybody is a detractor, or everybody who's not passive is a detractor, mm-hmm. to 100, where everybody who's not passive is a promoter. People say bad things about re-education, but... 
<laughs> Look, all I'm saying is that business degrees could have a different purpose. <laughs> One interesting thing I saw about this was a presentation from a Hewitt Packard guy who said that what you get from this sort of thing is that detractors and promoters are not actually going to leave your system because detractors are typically your captured audience. Either they can't leave or their boss won't let them leave or whatever. So the guy who would always give you negative reviews yeah. because his boss made him use the software, yep. passives are likely to leave, but they're not measured in this number. So this is a very interesting sort of construction because if you have one promoter, no passives and no detractors. You have a NPS of 100, baby. Or let's say 10 promoters and everybody else is passive. Same idea. Wait, is, is the NPS on customers or is it on workers? This is on customers. Oh, right. Okay, cool. So you use your customer satisfaction surveys in this sort of a structure where it is assumed that an answer on 1 to 6 is a detractor 7 to 8 is passive, or 9 to 10 is promoter, in the same way that unsatisfied, satisfied, or neutral kind of get that sort of alignment. This is just taking those results and transforming them into a different summary. And to be clear, this is this is the um, question when you're asked, how likely are you to recommend this service product yeah. to a friend? That's what this net promoter score are, is actually asking. Yeah, 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 yeah. But towards the start of the episode, you said, like, all of these things are sort of management fads that have been made up. And I want to really speak to that because this net promoter score is a proprietary concept. Oh god, it's so fucking funny. That some guy came <laughs> up with and, he's, and then he sold it to a bunch of companies. Yep. Did a whole bunch of talks on it because he makes his money this way. And then it got adopted because it's this new wave of way of doing things. And he makes money on all of the literature surrounding it. A whole bunch of blogs came up, sort of like net promoter score thinking. Uh, a whole bunch of new software as a service. Business businesses. mindset. Right. The, the, a whole bunch of new businesses opened up to parasitically offer services for net promoter score improvements to other businesses that you they would then net promoter score themselves, etc. Like, it's just this new... You know when you drop... Uh, you see those videos of, like, a, a fungal plate or, a, like, an agar plate, and they drop a new food source in, and the whole thing fucking goes nuts? Mm. That's that's what this is. And I want to point out that... It's, it's a human centipede of KPIs and marketing. Right, but I'm on, I'm on the rant now, and I'm going to keep <laughs> Go going. On, yeah. The thing is, right, people are always trying to come up with this shit because you can make a lot of money if you're the person who owns the proprietary stupid... Metric. <laughs> God, yes. I, I should get on that grift. Yeah, no, you, you, you could literally be making lots of money <laughs> by coming up with, with this stupid bullshit. And the thing is, right, this is dumb. And the person who came up with it is not particularly smarter than all of the rest. But because what is, has happened is that the agar plate here is, is profit, is the capital algorithm, right? And the bacteria that is Fungi. effective capital extraction happened to find Net Promoter Score particularly tasty, which is why it took off. So Net Promoter Score is fucked because it's a dumb idea, right? But it's also fucked because it's a dumb idea that happens to serve the interests of capital, which makes it even more evil because obviously the interests of capital is like, you want to talk about how the Dungeons and Dragons alignment system <laughs> isn't realistic because nothing's pure evil? <laughs> the profit mode is pure Fucking evil. <laughs> uh, that would be lawful evil, I think. Yeah, no, it's, it is literally lawful evil. I find that that uh, that whole matrix makes a lot more sense when you put um, capitalist as, as lawful evil, and then <laughs> your sort of your anarchist uh, resistance is your your chaotic good. Mm. But putting that aside, right? The net promoter score actually does make money for the people who embrace it, because again, the agar plate is really good at maximizing to eat uh, its food, like a slime mold sniffing out uh, walnuts in a maze. The net promoter score does actually make money because it happens to, by accident, measure this idea of captured audience. Do you, but you, you mentioned you didn't, you, your last video game console was, what was it? Probably like the PlayStation 2. I, I do play some games on my laptop sometimes, but yeah, I'm, I'm not like a, I'm not a gamer by any stretch of the imagination. But are you aware of the concept of like the console wars? Yes, I am. Yeah. Xbox versus PlayStation, who's going to get the best exclusives, etc., etc. Yeah, 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 absolutely. That, I think, was a really early example of sort of the net promoter model at work, right? These people aren't going on forums to talk shit about the other product or detract from hoping to, like, breed negativity amongst adopters of the other product because they were ne necessarily satisfied with their choice of PlayStation or Xbox, right? Their customer satisfaction is actually not linked to their net promoter score, right? If you fucking 
are bought into a particular system and a part of a, an ecosystem, if you're a whale for an MMO, if you are, uh, like me, a specialist in a very niche particular piece of software, if you are an adopter of an Xbox or PlayStation and you really need that system to continue because that's where all your friends and games and whatnot are, you have to be a promoter because it's essential to some part of your identity or in many cases to your livelihood. What the net promoter score is measuring is not how happy you've made your customers, but how much you have fucking addicted them. How you've trapped them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's literally, literally, right? The net promoter score is dumb and it's dumb as a KPI and it makes people miserable when you make it their KPIs, but it gets adopted because the agar plate of capitalism fucking loves it because it actually talks about, about capturing people, right? Let's just take a look at fucking NFTs, mm. those awful fucking ape shits. Yeah. All those people had to become the promoters. The scheme leaders, yeah. yes. Right, because it became like a pyramid scheme, right? All the people who fucking bought into... Multi-level marketing. Multi-level marketing. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Online property. Um, uh, Folding Ideas just did a great... Check out his channel. Uh, he just did a great... Um, dis on this product called Decentraland, which which proposed to sell digital real estate, right? <laughs> and, Fuck, I love right, that. One of the conclusions <laughs> he came to was that these people were cult-like, trapped as promoters permanently being pretending to be happy with their purchase because if they let it be seen that they were dissatisfied and had been fucking rorted then the value of this piece of land that they're trapped with talk about a way to make billion dollars billions of dollars disappear but those people are net promoters right well For i the think people who actually ran the initial land sale the entire economy post 2008 is like based around coming up with something fake and then trying to get out of it before the bubble collapses right like that's the whole exactly right and so you become an evangelical about whatever bullshit you're on just out of the fact of like it's an inflationary system and you yeah, have to yeah, be yeah, an sure. early adopter yeah so i find tesla owners are a really kind of interesting example of this yeah yeah absolutely particularly like elon musk written as like the character of elon musk not the guy but the character of Elon Musk is a really interesting kind of encapsulation of all of that. Yeah. Because the people who have wound up in the Elon Musk cult are very much the net promoters. You also see it more ephemeral, right? Like that guy who has all the Nazi memorabilia that's friends with the Chief Justice guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can't remember his name, but yes. Everyone who wrote out in support of him is directly paid for it by him in some way. <laughs> Fuck, it's so funny. <laughs> like, if you, if you scratch it even a little bit, it's like, oh yeah, they work for this institute that's solely funded by that guy. Yeah, absolutely. Like, right. it's I wonder <laughs> what material conditions might be at play here. And so we started this episode, like, and I pointed out how... These KPIs are ultimately just ways to reproduce these class and capital relations. The net promoter score is ultimately an example of this and like its purest form in that you're right, from, from 2008 onwards, everything was a fucking scam. Or from 2008 onwards, everything was about trapping somebody into a subscription model. The KPIs, as, as we spoke about a little later, are transforming these professional workers into proletarians but also making them more and more nakedly reproduce this, this capital relation. And the net promoter score is just this new way of trying to put makeup on the increasingly gaunt Terminator face of capital to mm. steal the um, the imagery from, uh, from Trash Future, the, uh, another podcast if you haven't listened to, you should check it out, right? They talk about how... As capital gets more and more desperate, as the rate of as the the and frontier the shrinks, fall, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. The naked machination becomes more and more obvious, and you have to keep painting it in more and more fucking clown makeup. And the capitalist realism just becomes more and more heightened. KPIs. I don't. I mean, I know we were talking about them just as like shit use of numbers, but ultimately, well, they're not. They are a political instruments, right? But they, they. But increasingly, they're becoming more and more bizarre because they have to keep hiding the fucking evil that's happening here because like like i just said net promoter score people fucking are getting destroyed by the institutions which want to turn them into a promoter yes so i want to make something clear here i think that this is happening on two levels these are getting more kind of eldritch numbers abstracted numbers on one level yeah but i have a perfect segue here into the next thing i want to talk about which is that there is a, a different system which behaves in much the same way and may or may not look like, be, be stated as a KPI, 
but which are I act as KPIs as kind of tools on labor, which is all of the surveillance shit. I just wanted to add that I think we're entering a new phase, and I realized this when I was watching the first football game back. Apart from the Crypto.com sponsorship on the score review, which is obviously like some long-term deal. <laughs> All the fucking sponsors were for budget stuff that a potential audience would actually buy. It was all like Coles, it was all Chemist Warehouse, it was shit like that. I think that the post-2008 thing is about to transform into something else. I'm not sure what that something else is. Going by history, it's probably going to be worse, but... I mean, we are entering an age of decreasing living conditions and increasing austerity. Yes, absolutely. The point of my rant was just that, yeah, these... The KPIs ultimately all stem from the underlying material conditions. Who fucking would have guessed? I, know, I mean, I know that's ultimately reductive, but I'm just, I was thinking about this and I really do think there's a direct connection between the nature of these KPIs and really the the particular interest of, of capital. Where, the, where the, the frontier, virtual or not, is presently positioned, all of these models for disciplining labor have to adapt to align towards this new last death rattle gasp of the system as it exists as it either dies or transforms into something awful and i think you're right but like the myth that this is just some blip is gone away and now everyone is like actually this is good because you're about to fucking see koshi go you know this might be a great opportunity for people to uh pull you know, themselves up by their own boots. yeah yeah to really reflect on what's important etc etc you're gonna see a transformation there for international issues uh koshi's a cunt <laughs> <laughs> that's all you need to know i'm gonna talk broadly about surveillance shit that comes in many different forms i've, I've listed this as pathology slash structure because this is the system behaving as intended a yeah. lot of the time is surveillance stuff but on top of that you have a lot of these KPIs become massively invasive of privacy and massive tools of surveillance, even if they weren't necessarily intended that way, as part of the effort to make labour measurable. What if Clippy was a Pinkerton? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What Looks if like Cl- you're forming a union. <laughs> I've informed your boss. <laughs> yeah, exactly. A lot of the stuff that comes out of surveillance may not be stated as a KPI per se, but you may lose your job if you do too much of it or too little of it. So the first of these numbers that I saw was what we call is called time off task. Oh yes. Or T O T. I first read about this being used at Amazon warehouses. I don't think they invented it, but this is broadly used in connection to a whole bunch of various little surveillance tools, whether it's the device that Amazon gives you that you use used to scan and track packages that says, hey, you haven't scanned or tracked a package in a while, you're not moving, you're off task, to stuff that is installed on white collar workers' laptops to surveil their use of the internet and things like that. Mm. Or to make sure that their mouse is moving every so often. The whole thing with white collar work, though, is that you get like very little productivity from it, right? <laughs> like, like the entire reason exi- it exists is so that like people can sit on Facebook for four hours a day. <laughs> like, <laughs> well, I mean, this is a fundamental conflict between the middle management drive to make thing make it look like you're forcing your workers to be productive and the reality of the bullshit jobs that those workers do which is to produce nothing <laughs> yeah well i mean but but keep in mind right that this is just like the next step and not even a, not even a new step no of trying to get people to think and behave like machines yeah, yeah yes course, absolutely yeah. So much of this is intimately related to that alienation process and that dehumanizing process I mean, it's. Um, I know we keep referencing a lot of other podcasts. It's breaking the um, uh, the mystery three thousand um, rule of not talking about a better film. But <laughs> like on a recent episode, uh, Chapo was talking about how the the work from home. It may have actually been Trash Future, but the work from home ultimately exposed how much of these jobs is not doing anything, and how much of going to the office is a way of providing a framework to justify that time. And so, yeah, yeah, it is performance of labour for middle management to justify their existence. Right, and so... KPIs cap- are the same thing. Capital's caught on to the idea that, wait, people aren't working for like six out of eight of the hours I'm paying them for, but hasn't yet caught on for, oh, my job's fake. Yes. Like, <laughs> they haven't worked out that their existence as society is, is propped up politically and not because of their own merit. Yeah. A lot of this surveillance stuff is a great way to alienate your workforce, regardless of the original intentions. And, like, so many of the surveillance 
tools and the measurement structures are infuriating for workers to try and implement. So these customer satisfaction surveys, for example, that rely on you harassing the people who you've done this thing for in order to get them to tick this box, everybody hates that. Yeah. I, I have a theory that there's a certain type of person within our generation who fucking loves that shit just because it's like a expression of their consumer identity uh, i was gonna say narcissism but same same idea <laughs> yeah oh yeah 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 as if your opinion should count towards somebody else's well-being yeah yeah or not just narcissism but also like class position yeah yeah i went as well as Bart. went to a fancy private school and i still am friends with people who i have to tell off for giving shit reviews or deciding like to to tell off somebody in a, in a restaurant and it's like or not tip in restaurants. And yeah, and like they, they have all of the ideology associated to them that what they're doing is actually like helping that person improve, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Really, to them, the reason that they're doing it is, is they went out to the fancy restaurant to pay the premium to enjoy that. To their, have servants. To enjoy the service, right? And it is a feature of the service to fuck with the service by, you know, politely uh, telling them, maybe you should have done this a little differently. It's like, Maybe you should fucking eat a dick. Oh, <laughs> fuck me. My uh, ex-girlfriend's dad was a very fancy lad and uh, <laughs> would click at waiters. And I found it so embarrassing. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. <laughs> Disgusting. But I would love to see him. I think that the French uh, service industry has the best approach to this, which is that you should be able to, the, the wait staff should be able to abuse the yeah, customers. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Karen's diner should exist, but just for this person. Yes. <laughs> this guy was a mine owner whose background Ugh. was as a, his like parents were like white colonial people in Bangladesh. Oh. <laughs> yeah, nationalize Karen's so diner and then make this person dine there. <laughs> oh, awful. I consistently do not know how to relate to to wait stuff. My interaction should be as little as possible. Do not make eye contact, please. And on their terms. And on their terms. You, you just just come and ask me when you're ready. I don't want to be, be bothering you. <laughs> I know your job fucking sucks. Like, it, when I can afford it, which is rarely, but I don't mind going to a fancy restaurant. Like, I don't know. I've had, like, friends who've worked in fancy restaurants and stuff, and it's just like... No, no, so I, I really like going to fancy restaurants, yeah, yeah. but the fancy restaurants that I like going to are the ones where... I reasonably believe that the wait staff would tell me to fuck off <laughs> if they wanted to. Yeah, and like they are not very common, right? Because of the audience, if you will, for or the the, the patron class for those kind of restaurants. Sure, absolutely. But where they exist, they're really good. And like the cafes that I tend to frequent are similar. I have confidence that the wait staff would feel safe telling me to fuck off. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And she also asks them what they earn. <laughs> she just straight up asks them how they're, how they're doing. So, so that's a specific case where it's a the cafe that I've gone to basically every day for the past four sure, years. Yeah, yeah. Where I, I know all the staff and I have, in fact, helped the staff work out what their conditions should be. So that's a slightly different environment. That's true. Yeah, Tess is not like... <laughs> I'm not harassing white staff at a random restaurant about what they're being paid. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. If they wish to talk to me about that, happy to do it. Yeah. But, you know, I'm not going to ask. That's just <laughs> trouble. So, all right. I want to talk about the, if you will, ideal implementation of KPIs, brackets, under capitalism. I think I just did this rant. <laughs> <laughs> I am framing this in the context of, like, one of the people that I talked to who had an incredibly abusive system of KPIs applied to them, now works in human resources and has been asked to write KPIs. Mm. So this is partly for her. My first idea here is that these are a political tool. They are an instrument of power in the negotiation of labor. So they should be democratically constructed. Uh, the capitalist whines. What if they vote for ones that make them have to do less work? To which you respond, yeah, what if they vote for that? Yeah, exactly. Eat shit. So these are KPIs that are agreed to by workers, unions, and management, because management's going to have to agree to them at some point, I suppose, and that workers have a genuine say on their construction. So that means that workers have a genuine say on what is being measured, how it is being measured, and how those measurements are used to do things like what level is this KPI set at? What level, if there is a level, are there additional rewards? I mean, like, that's against the function of HR, right, though? Yeah. Well, this is why I find uh, this, conversa this ongoing conversation with this friend of mine very interesting, because she in her kind of approach to this is not approaching it from the perspective of I am HR there to protect the company. 
Second is transparency. And like these two clearly go together, right? It's hard to have a transparent process that is not in some way like meaningfully democratic. It's hard to have a democratic process that is not meaningfully transparent. So this is again, what is being measured? How is it being measured? Thresholds are all clear and accessible to workers and critically, that they have access to that data. So these measurements being done on them are not something that is a tool accessible only to management. A worker should be able to go and look at the data that is collected on them to see their own behavior, but that should not necessarily be something that is public. And I, and I say that explicitly because I have seen these incredibly pathological, like, huge screen in the office showing where everybody's KPI metrics are at. I think, Dean, you had this at one point. Yeah, so we were sitting in a particular section of the office, and then a huge plasma TV on the wall, just running constantly, wasting all their energy, broadcasting, like, top customer comments, and everyone's, like, various uh, yeah. KPIs. <laughs> like, cases closed and all this sort of thing. And that, that is an abusive use of the surveillance, and it's an invasion of privacy as well. Well, they, they said it as a positive thing, and because our team was doing well, you know, that was fine. But I actually liked that board, not in the sense that it was up on the wall, but, like, when we had access to it as a team. Yeah, yeah, yeah. As a small team, we could see who was struggling on that day. We could help each other. Yeah. Right? You can actually have solidarity yeah. out of that transparency. But when, like sales can wander over and just start fucking commenting on it. It's none of your business. Yeah, yeah. So this is where, like, the kind of democratic control and the transparency and the privacy overlap. Mm -hmm. So workers should be able to say, for example, well, within our team, it's useful for us to be able to see this metric for each other. Yeah. yeah. But we don't want the salespeople to be able to fuck around with it, you know? Yeah, no, absolutely. Another part of this transparency is that a mechanism for change should be transparent and available. I say transparent because management suddenly deciding to change KPIs happens a lot and shouldn't. That process should be transparent, but also that if KPIs are seen to need to change for some reason, that is a negotiation process between management unions and workers, or at least it should be under this ideal sort of system. Mm. Because, I mean, one of the things that came up in talking to various people was talking about a change that needed to happen in KPIs because they needed to measure something new in order to reflect this work that was being done. And that was workers said, the current measurement system isn't helping us. Here is a thing that can be introduced to make it work better. So that was a case where a change to this system was implemented in response to a need that the workers saw as well as management. That sort of transparency and that system of review, I suppose you can call it, is really useful and can genuinely improve these systems. This one is a bit sort of tenuous, but if I, I want to put in here like a negotiated material reward. Yeah, I can see why this is tenuous. Yeah, because like this is that idea that you have the kind of KPI threshold where you get performance managed at, and you have the KPI threshold where you get a bonus. Now, to some extent, having that bonus system allows somebody to, I suppose, have a piece of the success of the company. Yeah. Theoretically. The problem being that then part of their wages are basically gatekept behind this higher threshold. Yeah, like I said, you just end up with a smiling... Yes, a the... smiling face on the stick, right? It's the same way that a benefit awarded to somebody for something is something is a, a stick provided to those who don't do it. Yeah. I mean, I don't mind... As long as it's not used to justify lower pay... Yes. I don't mind the idea of, um, if you're a publicly traded company, allotting shares to employees... Because then they become the shareholder. Yeah. I, boy, I do love some uh, worker ownership of the means of production. Right. right? And like, it's a kind of... That should not be based on performance. Performance. Yeah, that yeah, yeah. Be... That's right, right, very right. different. Yeah. I'm not saying access to the shares should be related to performance. I'm saying that if you gave shares to people and say, hey, everyone, if we do really well... We get um, more money from Your them. shares will be worth... Yes. Yeah, yeah, no, no. That makes much more sense. Yeah, yeah. Having work part ownership of the means of production means that if there is better production going on, if the business is, if we say, more profitable, then the workers get more rewards, right, for, the, for their labor. I don't know if that can be meaningfully worked into this KPI system without worker ownership, direct worker ownership. Because if it's not through that direct ownership sort of thing, then it winds up being this more like gatekeeping of salary yeah. Sort of thing. Bonuses are not actually a meaningful redistribution of power. 
No. And, and that's part of this kind of, this is why this is a tenuous one, right? Well, keep, keep in mind what's at the top of the slide under capitalism. Like, obviously, yes. a great solution would be, you know, worker ownership of the... Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, one uh, one of the kind of examples that I heard about this from an, another friend, for whom it was a very radicalizing experience, he got a certificate for doing a million dollars in sales in a retail job, where he was paid minimum wage. Yeah, <laughs> part of that million dollars. Yeah, part of that million dollars of sales was a single day where, at the end of the day, he went and filed his cash draw and was sitting there with fifty thousand dollars in front of him on the table. And he just looked at that and he made the calculation: how far could I get? Because, <laughs> because, like at the time, that was more than a year of his salary. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. This is part of the pathology of this negotiated material reward, right? Like, I think he got my, a certificate and maybe a few hundred dollars bonus for a million dollars in sales. That's just yeah. fucking insulting. But that's why I, if we have. If we're going to talk about the tenuous negotiated material reward, that's why the, the idea of the publicly traded company yeah. is so appealing because it is, it's more like worker ownership than a bonus. Yeah. I saw this incredibly funny thing uh, a while ago, which was like some conservative guy talking about workers owning shares and saying, no, no, this is not socialism. We're turning them into capitalists. Yeah. yeah. And it's like, I kind of get what he's saying there. Because w when the worker leaves, leaves the company, they don't give up the shares. Oh, well, also, like, you are aligning material conditions with, like... The capitalist class, yeah. With ca with the capitalist class, like, in terms of, like... It's the same way that superannuation fucking... Yes. Oh, my God. Yep. Has We're going to do a whole brains, episode but... on superannuation <laughs> at some point, because, fuck, I hate that system. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, as a stroke of ideological... Genius. Engineering, it is genius, Yeah, right? yeah. You've turned everyone into somebody worried about the fucking capital fluctuations and yep. all this sort of bullshit. It was, yeah, I fucking hate it. <laughs> Good luck getting rid of it. Paul Keating, great hero of the fucking working class. Yeah. He came out a couple of years ago and said, oh, actually, maybe this neoliberal experiment hasn't been successful and we should try something else. <laughs> you motherfucker. <laughs> Well, look, credit to him. None of the other cunts are saying that. Yeah, true, but like... I cannot give someone a pass if they had power and use it for bad things <laughs> and then after their prime ministership... Like, yeah, I'm uh, sure he's very legal. comfortable. Yeah. Oh, you know, <sighs> I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not letting go off the hook. I'm just comparing him. They're all in the fucking bin, but I can... Yeah. <laughs> make a comparison against the... What, it's fucking... Um, Blair? Blair. Who's yeah. still insisting that, no, it's we just didn't do it hard enough. <laughs> <laughs> the line cannot fail us. We failed the line. God, I hope hell is real. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. A couple more points here. I mentioned this before, but a, a meaningful review mechanism. And, and I was about to say, you know, that meaningful is doing a lot of heavy lifting, but again, it's, it's under capitalism, so... Yeah, I mean, what I mean by a meaningful review mechanism is that workers get to say when something is pathological or hurting them yeah. workers get to say we need to change this in these ways or come up with new kpis or whatever else change the thresholds they should have power in that system and like even if you're going to be a cynical bastard about this right doing kpis in this method under capitalism may actually well i i suspect would make workers more engaged it would make them more willing to operate within that system and would give you a better kpi system in part because of that worker buy-in also in part because workers actually know what their jobs are yeah, and but, they know what you can meaningfully measure on those jobs but as i sort of got into sort of left thinking and left politics i ran into the thing that sort of your enlightened centrist yeah jerk comes to which is like you know if companies just did all this stuff that was good and right, they'd actually make more money. Yeah, but it's not about that. It's, it's about maintaining the class relations. Yeah. Exactly, right? Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. it's the, the shitty relationship is the point. Yes. The idea that, you know, if you enacted all of these, <laughs> it would result in better worker buy-in. Worker buy-in doesn't not... fucking matter. That's never been the goal. I have had conversations with some people who are interested in it. Right. If but... they listen to this, I want to give them a meaningful way to look at that. I think on the whole, absolutely. KPIs are not there to make for a meaningful relationship. Right. But those people are bad capitalists. Sure. And we, <laughs> I wish to encourage and, it, and support that behavior. We love class traders. Yes. Arguably, I am one. Or at least I'm an aspiring class trader. Yeah, yeah. But I don't want to be too cynical, right? I know you've put ideal in quotes and you put the big under capitalism in brackets, etc., etc. But 
you can immediately see that what you'd end up is with like the union KPIs and then management would say, we've also got this other number. That's, that's our, what we're actually measuring. Yeah. What we're, that we're actually measuring. And without the worker power to punish capital yes, yes. for engaging in that behavior, the KPI model, as it is a necessary function of that relationship, would just reproduce itself like the fucking single cell of a slime mold on the agar plate. <laughs> yeah. I love that analogy, but it's, you know, it's so good. Like the interest in KPIs as a method of, method of discipline would reproduce itself even if you had these, this ideal. I will say if you work for Australia Post, the union has never agreed to indoor times. You do not have to follow them if you are under any pressure or whatever. Oh, that's good to know. Well, there we go. Yeah, but you need you have to have a union. You have to have some <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. threat. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and the only way you get this democratic construction is really through worker organizing. Yeah, precisely. And- or, you know, I bet, you know, you need some government enforcement, but that would only come from the union organizing. Yeah, yeah, labor to do all this. What I'm saying is, is that every worker should have a button connected to a pipe bomb in their manager's <laughs> ass. <laughs> and I think that that represents the ultimate next stage of, ca- of capitalism, of, ca- of, of, <laughs> of, a, of a prosperous capital <laughs> relationship. I would also say, like, including my friends and stuff, I'm not like morally judging anyone for this, but like, people get like, pretty fucking cop-like when it comes to like other people being lazy and yes. you gotta yeah. kill that in your head you know i think that a lot of that comes from like the massive alienation from labor and the fact that so many people see their labor as bullshit yeah frankly most of the time they're right that their labor is bullshit i mean yeah i at least am doing something useful but this is just <laughs> something <laughs> that's yeah, come yeah, up yeah. The- this is part of like how you have to frame your thinking around this. If people think that their work is meaningful, they're not going to be so inclined to fuck around. Just to go back to what you were saying, Bart, about like not being cop-like to your fellow workers. To your fellow workers, like I do get if you if there's somebody who is making your job harder due to their um, incompetence or, or inability, yeah, or, or quote unquote laziness. Yeah, I do get how that like can suck if you're in that position. This is not that. This is like people just like spying on someone else and going oh they're getting way more overtime than me because they're just like doing it slower you know yeah yeah i I get that but i'm saying even in the case where somebody's slower like just keep in mind that your boss is going to find a way like we discussed at the, the start to try and systematically claim your skill and ability which is in which is in excess of your that of your co-workers they're going to find a way to siphon that away from you and make you work hard yeah as a way to do it. The fact that your co-worker is what's doing that to you right now, it's like, it's not great, but at least it's not your fucking boss. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> like, for sure. <laughs> and if you are that lazy bastard like me, buy lunch for your co-workers who work harder than you. That's always been my <laughs> policy. No one's ever complained about me being lazy. To your yeah. face. No, because I, for me. because I explicitly say to them when I'm taking for lunch, you work so much harder than me. I'll get you lunch every so often. People are happy with that relationship. Solidarity, it works. Mm -hmm. You still need to do stuff around the house, though. I will not vacuum. (laughs) (laughs) I do want to put one last thing down here before this two-hour episode ends. Jesus Christ, this is going to be punishing to edit. Which is that if you have this KPI systems, support before punishment. Yeah, and I'd like to reiterate something again that uh, Better Podcast Trash Future has said, which is that if you're struggling at your job... Do not tell your boss. Mm. Mm. Never tell your boss because under capitalism, they will apply exactly as much support as is required to meet a uh, KPI, k- a, their own KPI if they're a HR person or their legal requirements before they fucking gut you. Like I actually liked the last place I worked, but like I said, it was terrible for my mental health. I told my bosses this is what was happening. Uh, I received support that I would say was above what is standard, but ultimately was insufficient. And then after a certain point where it became clear that uh, I was going to like need psychiatric help, which I have received outside of them and has outside of them and has helped before I reached that point, uh, I was let go. You're specifically talking about support before punishment. Again, I just don't think this is going to like I, you say under capitalism and it's ideal that will never be support before punishment. The only reason you would be supported before punished is because you have had investment into your skills in that particular role. Yes, but this is part of that like a recognition of the fact that even from a capitalist perspective, it is an investment to hire somebody and train them up. I mean, I am also saying this in the context that there are some jobs, 
I'm an academic. I have a very, my relationship to KPIs is, shall we say, not directly one through profit. And I have basically none of them. Yes. But like academia is a shit and a working environment for other reasons. Right. But this idea of using a metric, a measurement system to recognize when somebody is having problems in order to support them and, and improve their work in some way before you just implement punishments Again, it, it's one of those things where it, it makes sense from a productivity standpoint, yeah. but not from a class power relations standpoint. That's what I'm getting at. Like, yeah, that, this is where you get the, the base centrist take of, you know, oh, I want to... They could actually make more money if they did this, but of course they don't want to do that. I'm going to do prematurely end the episode by being hungry and walking away. Goodbye. <laughs> Thank you very much, Bart. <laughs> yeah, I'll see you later. Have a good one.